At the beginning of last year, I realized I needed to change my life. After successfully founding three companies and two courses at UCT Graduate School of Business, I was exhausted. Uh, I was working really long hours. Uh, I felt like I didn't have any time and space away from being connected, dealing with the never-ending barrage of emails, instant messengers, texts. Uh, my health was breaking down. I put on a lot of weight, not muscle. <laughs> and the people closest to me were complaining that I wasn't really present with them, that stuff that was happening outside of the room through the screen was affecting the way that I related to them. So I got really interested in this idea of slow tech, and this idea of using technology wisely. You know, I love technology. It's everything that I do. The companies that I started with, the technology companies, and the courses that I ran were all about social media. And I realized that in design, Good design doesn't seek to fill up every square inch of the page with typography and graphics. It leaves white space for emphasis and to draw our attention to what's really important. Perfection, they say, is achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. And strategy, a mentor once told me, is not what you do, it's what you don't do. So why is it then, when we talk about productivity, it seems to be about cramming more things to do into every square inch or minute of our days? in our weeks. So this talk really is about finding white space in our schedule and in our day. And particularly, I think this is important because we've become so hooked on the technologies that can give us so many cool things to do and think about. When I first saw this map of the internet, I thought that it looked really like a human brain. And these aren't uh, neuron synapses and axons. These are uh, servers, server farms. These are cables and fibers. And at the internet, research has shown we actually treat like uh, short-term transactive memory. So when we need to know something, whereas uh, in the past you might have to go within or go to a library, now you can just ask Google, the death of the pub quiz. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and we've kind of become codependent on these things. And I've heard uh, people older than me complaining that uh, you know, the kids of today are you know, becoming too dependent on these things and we're uh, forgetting how to think. Uh, by the way, 90% of the world's data I read has been created uh, in the last two years. So it's quite extraordinary what this internet has given rise to. But the problems that we face aren't new. Uh, in fact, in Phaedrus, Plato complained that we were becoming too dependent on the technology of the day, writing. <laughs> he was saying that uh, we're, we're committing too, many of our, of our, too much of our memory to this, and the people who, that, who seem wise may just be wise because they've read it somewhere. Right? So it turns out literacy wasn't such a bad thing in retrospect. Uh, you know, does anyone know what was the first coding language? The alphabet. <laughs> um, I heard about this technology the other day that lets you see through walls. Windows. <laughs> <laughs> so we live with technology. It's just technology as anything that was invented. Any uh, technology as anything that was invented after you were born. So it's not the technology. <laughs> it's not the technologies itself that we're getting caught up on. It's our over enthusiasm with it because it's all new and it's shiny. And I think that. Living in such a heady time with new technologies, because we're so enthusiastic about it, can actually be destructive to our physiques. And we've got to learn lessons now that other generations will take for granted. So I think the big game changer is that we can take this information with us anywhere, all the time. We can be busy with something, and other kinds of information will start coming in at us. Um, the, most people's response to this is simply to go faster. I've got so much work to do. It's so complex. I'm going to work longer hours, take shorter breaks, multitask more. Sound familiar? Yeah? Um, has anyone here ever bumped into someone or something while walking and texting? <laughs> <laughs> One in five people. <laughs> I think that that stat may be outdated somewhat. Uh, this. This is basically an immature approach, this idea that we've got this finite system, all right? We still need eight hours of sleep, uh, and we're dealing with an infinite resource. Uh, all of this information and all of this complexity, guess what? The information ain't slowing down, people. <laughs> You're always going to have too much work to do unless you learn to prioritize. 
So instead of going faster, I think that we just need better filters for information. We need a system to determine what's really important for us. So just as an exercise, what I'd like you to do is look around and try and spot five things that are green and remember them. Do it now. Five things that are green and remember them. Or a shade of green. Okay. The one guy with the green shirt is like, stop looking at me. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, stop. All right, now close your eyes. Close your eyes, and what I want to do is just a memory test. I want you to remember everything you saw that was blue. Remember? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so what, this, what this little exercise teaches us is we see what we're looking for, not necessarily what's there. So reality is very much, uh, our reality, our experience of reality is very much a result of where we choose to put our attention. So the first filter that I use for using the internet isn't uh, Zyte or uh, Google's uh, intelligent inbox, it's journaling. I journal every day or I start a journaling every day uh, to help me determine what my priorities are. Uh, I write to-do lists, but I also write to-don't lists, and I write to-learn lists. And these things start to pop out to me, and I start to notice things around me differently. And when something comes up that's pure distraction, uh, I put it aside to when I need to be creative and to think a little bit differently. And this has helped a lot. Another thing that I've learned is to draw boundaries. When I first got a mobile phone, I got excited because it meant that I could organize my weekends from at work. And if there's anyone old enough to remember that dreaded personal call at the shared office phone, uh, you know, my mom calling me on my first day of work, <laughs> you know, doing the walk of shame. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. It's going well. <laughs> you know, nowadays we've got text messaging for that. Um, but we still need boundaries. We need time to switch off. So I'm, I'm really attracted by, for example, Tiffany Schlein's idea of the tech shabbos, where we take a day a week and we just switch off from technology. Or another one uh, that, perhaps for the not-so-extreme, is the digital detox, where for one weekend a month, you turn off your devices, you let everyone know that you're going to be out of touch. Perhaps you go somewhere, you know, in the Cedarburg, uh, and you just learn to think differently, and you go slow, and you experience a different pace of life, and you get in touch with what's real and what's tangible. Social media is another one. I heard it said that uh, digital technologies bring people that are far apart closer together, but can also bring people who are close together further apart. And I think these days, the greatest gift that you can give someone when you're with them is your full attention. It shows that they matter to you, that they're worth your attention, they're worth your while. And I think that being in two places at once these days, I think, can uh, be a little bit demeaning for a lot of people, particularly the older generations. Take note. <laughs> uh, but also, I think another great filter that social media can give us is uh, a way to access a better quality of news and information and perspectives. Nicholas Christakis, in his TED Talk, talked about how uh, types of thinking and perspectives, depression, happiness, even obesity, these kinds of things that we didn't think are contagious are contagious. And certainly, uh, I found that you know, who I choose to follow on Twitter or Instagram affects my worldview. So I think that we've got to be really selective about who we follow online. One thing I've heard is you know, Facebook is for the people you went to school with, Twitter is for the people you wish you went to school with. And remember that our real-world relationships aren't as mutable as those online. At work, digital technologies, uh, of course, uh, can be quite distracting, but I'd like to draw you to another kind of research. Uh, Brent Coker at the University of Melbourne showed that people that were allowed to browse the web freely at work were 9% more productive. But there was a catch, as long as they didn't spend more than 20% of their day online. All right, so I think that while social media can be good and looking at a cat picture can improve your mood, you know, or a video of someone wiping out can be fantastic uh, to put things into perspective for you, I think that we need to set certain times during the day aside where this is actually going to be productive and useful for us. Email is another one. Uh, I, read a, I read a study that showed that people distracted by email were much more stressed than those who weren't. And Linda Stone talks about email apnea, which is the tendency of people doing email to hold their breath slightly. 
And when you hold your breath slightly, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and cortisol gets downloaded into your bloodstream and some people experience a kick of adrenaline. So you're sitting there doing your email and your body thinks it's being chased by a mammoth animal. <laughs> and all you need to do is remember to take a deep breath. Do it right now. Whenever anyone talks about breath, I remember. <laughs> Take a deep breath, do it now, because it puts you into a different space. And it's difficult at first, so what I did is I used a system called Growl on my computer, and every 20 minutes to get me into the habit of doing this, a little reminder came up. It said, breathe. <laughs> and it was like a balloon being popped in the beginning. <laughs> and then back on with work. So that's one thing. Multitasking is another. We think that we're being more productive. If I ask you when you're busy multitasking, are you being more productive or are you being less productive? Most people will say, I'm getting way more done. Look at all these balls I've got in the air. But actually, when we're multitasking, we suffer from a kind of uh, mental retardation. Uh, people that are multitasking show lower levels of comprehension than people who are stoned. <laughs> now, is this any way to act at work? <laughs> They're, they're error rates, I mean, you can test this for yourself. Have you, has anyone ever called you when you're working on something and you realize that you have no idea what they're talking about? So you just start going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes. <laughs> Daniel Kahneman talks about two kinds of thinking. The automatic thinking, which is, you know, when we can multitask, you know, walk and talk, you know, cook and listen to music. And then there's complex thinking. Uh, which is uh, which requires or effortful thinking, which requires effort, and that we can only do one thing at a time. And to do our best work, we need effortful thinking, and that requires uninterrupted time and space to do one thing at a time. So another thing that I started doing is no more tab browsing. When I'm reading an article, immerse myself in it. When I'm doing email, just do email. When I'm working on a document, just work on that document. So Herbert Simon said that. In the 70s, as we produce more and more information, what all this information consumes is attention. So a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And it leaves the people who have attention with the need to allocate it very wisely, as if we've got this limited budget. And thinking about my attention like this, like I have a budget and I choose where to invest it, and some places give me better returns than other places has been really valuable. I found that it's not just a matter of managing my time, but managing my attention too. That's changed my life and the quality of my work. By the way, I lost the weight and I've grown my business by a third at the same time over the past year. So just in conclusion, all of these technologies, these digital technologies that I've talked to you about uh, are brilliant for memory, to access kinds of information and experiences and media that we didn't have access to before. They're brilliant for uh, bringing groups of people together based on a topic of shared interest. Uh, and they're brilliant for computation. But what these technologies can't do for us is create meaning. That's something uniquely human. And unless we create white space for ourselves, I think that too much use of these technologies or uneducated use of these technologies can give us a sense of loss of our humanity. So that's my message for you today. Thank you very much.